Well, let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Romans this morning. I uh, don't want to leave anybody with the impression that we think one part of the Bible is more important than another part of the Bible. Uh, scripture is very clear that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is good for us. All Scripture is beneficial. But at the same time, the book of Romans is a very special book because more so, I think, than any other part of the New Testament, we see explanation of how the holy God can reach down to sinful man and without compromising his purity and his integrity and principles of justice, restore us to right relationship with him. It's a beautiful book with so much to offer us and so much to learn from. So we continue that journey this morning. Good to see pastors Doug and Gwen Hacking here from Nacom this morning. Great to have you. Uh, this was their church until they said yes to the call of God to pastor. So glad you've dropped in and uh, give them a warm hand this morning. So we finished last week the end of verse 7. And when we got to the end of verse 7, we had finished the first sentence of the book of Romans. That's one sentence. Verse 1 through to 7 is one sentence. So it took us about six weeks to plow through a sentence. So I have no idea how long it's going to take us to get through 16 chapters. So after one sentence, we're finally at verse number 8, but, but I want to draw our attention just for a moment to, to verse number 5 before we look at verses 8 to 17. Through whom, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. I want to point out two things here. I want to remind you that everything we do as Christians, everything we do as a church, is for his name's sake. It's for his name's sake. And if it ever becomes about us, us getting attention, us needing recognition, we have got way off track. We do everything we do for his name's sake. And the second really key phrase in verse 5 is that Paul was dedicated in his ministry to bring people to, second line on the screen, the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. There's a challenge there for us in 21st century North America because we have settled for something much less. We pursue professions of faith. We pursue professions of faith. We're really excited when we can get somebody to raise their hand and say yes. And we stop there. But the calling of God's Spirit upon our lives is a call to the obedience of faith. We cannot settle at the starting gate we need to be pursuing, pressing on, moving towards the obedience of faith. So now let's get out of the first sentence. And we get to the second sentence, and it starts with the word first. So what Paul is saying here is, yeah, that sentence was neat, but here's, what I, here's the first thing I want to say to you. So we really haven't heard anything he really wants to say to us yet. Now we're at the first thing he wants to say to you. So let's stand together, and why don't we read this out loud together and allow the Spirit of God to speak to us as we do. Romans chapter 1, 
beginning at verse number eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers making request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that is, you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles." I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Father, be our teacher today. Holy Spirit, come and help us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. The gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It was about three weeks ago that uh, Elaine King, who works uh, with us at the district office, placed on my desk a book I'd asked her to get a hold of for me called Canadian Pentecostals. I had never heard of the book. I didn't know it was written. It's a history of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. I've read other books about us, but I'd never read this book. So for the last uh, two and a half weeks or so, my, my bedtime stories as I'm laying in bed have been out of this great book by Thomas Miller, Canadian Pentecostals. One of the stories in that book is the story of James Montgomery. James Montgomery was born in Northern Ireland. At the age of 15, he ran across, uh, came, in, came into relationship with a 15-year, uh, an elderly uh, Methodist man. This elderly Methodist man shared with him the power of the gospel, the life-transforming power of the good news. James said yes to Jesus. And he was subsequently filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, in new languages and was filled with this power that came from God. But the problem was Daddy wasn't so excited about it. Dad was a Roman Catholic, and Dad kicked his 15-year-old son out of the house because he believed in the power of the gospel and he spoke in tongues. James spent the next five years wandering around the, the back roads of Northern Ireland, declaring the gospel, talking to people about Jesus. At the age of 20, he emigrated to Canada, landed in the Maritimes, eventually became the district superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada in, in Maritimes, eventually an executive officer in Toronto. But it was said of this young man born in Ireland whose family rejected him when he came to the Maritimes. This didn't happen every time he would preach, but when he was preaching, he had a habit of walking. And he would walk not sideways, but more backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And it was said that on occasion, it's never happened to me, I don't know what this says about my ministry, but, but it says, it was, the stories are that when he would preach and he would start to move into the crowd, the whole crowd would rush out of the building because the power of God was too strong when he got close to them. And then when they had heard that he had returned to where he belongs, up at the front, they would come back in 
And then he would move again out into the crowd and everybody would run out because the power of God was so strong they, they couldn't stand being so close to the power. And then he'd move back and they'd come back in. There was a power about his ministry. Where does the power come from? The gospel is the the gospel is the the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We read about this great power in this portion. I was sitting in uh, our family room yesterday. No, it was Friday afternoon, I think. Uh, just kind of looking at the portion and quietly thinking and praying, and I noticed something in these, in these 10 verses, verses 8 to 17, that I had never noticed until I was just reading it over and over again myself. And, and I don't think any of the commentaries I studied had pointed it out, but 13 times in these 10 verses, Paul uses the word I. 13 times. I do not want you to be unaware. I'm under... I he talks a lot about himself in these 10 verses. And what we get out of these 10 verses is Paul's heart for ministry. And I want to talk to us as the neighborhood church this morning about what a genuine heart for ministry looks like. I want to talk about what a genuine heart for ministry looks like. And I'm going to quickly go over some uh, basic points here, uh, and then I'm going to zero in especially on verses 9 and 10. But going over some quick points here, uh, first of all, the ministry heart is thankful to God for things that happen that have had nothing, they have had nothing to do with, that they have had nothing to do with. Paul had never been to Rome. Paul had never been to Rome. And yet he says in verse number 8, I thank my God for all of you. I thank God that through you the gospel's being proclaimed. Genuine ministry is thankful when they see God being honored and the name of Christ being glorified. Immature people, self-centered people can never rejoice when something good is happening if their hands haven't been part of it. Because they don't realize it's not about them and it's for his name's sake. But genuine ministry rejoices wherever Jesus is being honored and Jesus is being glorified and the gospel is going forward. He's praying here for people he had never ever met and he's being thankful for them. Number two, it's all about serving. It is all about serving. He says in verse number nine, I serve God whom I, I serve. A genuine ministry moves in spirit. I serve in my spirit. Genuine ministry preaches the gospel. There's a lot of watered down Christianity floating around out there. And they're suggesting that all we need to do is, as believers is, is just let our light shine and be really nice people. That's a real problem. That's a real problem. Because the world is full of really nice people. As a matter of fact, you may not believe this, but I actually know some people who don't know Jesus who are nicer than some of you. Oops, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Niceness will not add people to the kingdom of God. If we have a genuine ministry, it involves the declaration of the, the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. Genuine ministry is prayerful. 
always in my prayers, making requests. Genuine ministry is marked by impartation. Genuine ministry isn't interested in just putting in time, making a speech, going out for coffee, whatever. Genuine ministry is always interested in leaving something behind. It's always interested in impartation, giving something. It is lived with and amongst. I've already offended you by suggesting that there are some nice people out there. Let me offend you right away again. I'm seeing like if I can become like James Montgomery where everybody leaves, you see. <laughs> but, but I don't think real genuine ministry can take place hiding behind your laptop. It has to be lived out with. It has to be lived out amongst. We have to be connected to real people. It's with. It's amongst. It desires fruit. And lastly, it's marked by this eagerness, this zeal. Uh, Paul says in, in verse number 15, I am eager to preach the gospel. Genuine ministry knows that ministry is really, really important. So, so, so I give you that list and, and, and you say, well, that, that's good, that's, that's fine, pastor. Uh, I'm glad you're worried about those nine things. I hope you have a heart that is genuine. Great list, preacher. <laughs> Power of the gospel. <laughs> Great list preacher. But uh, what's it got to do with me? What's it got to do with me? Well, the truth of the matter is that every one of us here needs to recognize and regard ourselves first and foremost as ministers of Christ. Every one of us here needs to regard ourselves first and foremost as ministers of Christ. It was about a century ago a wealthy man who was in the meatpacking business said, I am a witness of Jesus Christ and I just happened to make some money packing pork. I'm a witness of Jesus Christ, and I just happened to make some money packing pork. Some of you work in the financial industry, and uh, the truth is that uh, if you're a Christian, you primarily are a witness of Jesus Christ, and you, you incidentally make some money in the financial industry, but but the primary thing you are is you are a witness of Jesus Christ. Some of you uh, work in the healthcare field, and we salute you today. But you are not primarily a healthcare provider, you are a witness of Jesus Christ who happens to generate some income in the healthcare, in the healthcare industry. All of us our ministers, and all of us need to be marked by, by these kind of traits and, and these kind of, of characteristics. So how does, that, how does that work out? I want to zero in on verses 9 and 10 for the rest of our time together this afternoon. First thing I want to point out is it's all about serving. It is all about serving. Paul says in verse number nine, God whom I serve. God whom I serve. Paul introduces himself into, into, uh, to us at the beginning of Romans in verse number one where he says, I am a bond servant. 
of Jesus Christ. It's all about serving. We are just servants. And the church of Jesus Christ is in trouble. If there's ever a spirit that rises up within us that says, well, I got tenure around here. I've been around here a lot longer than a lot of those people, so everybody better start listening to me. We're in trouble if that spirit ever becomes a part of us. Because we are all just servants. Pastor, you better listen to me. Because I am one of the best givers in this church. Well, you may be, and thank you. But really, that's got very little to do with anything because we're all just servants. Just servants. And we dare not do ministry with any other attitude. Ministers are servants. Ministers are servants. And this church and I am in trouble if I ever think that uh, I, can, I can begin to lord it over you, I can begin to boss you around. That's not my position in this house. My position in this house is to serve you as well as I possibly can. We are servants. Paul says, God whom I, I serve. 1 Peter 5 verse 3 has this sober warning for those of us who, who uh, get our paychecks from ministry, not yet lording it over those allotted to your charge. You better listen to me. I'm your pastor. It's not the spirit of ministry. It's not the spirit of ministry. Now, can I flip the coin a little bit? If you're servants, you better listen to your pastor because... You're also a servant. We're a house full of, of servants. We're not pursuing power and recognition and authority and this need to be in charge. And boy, it better be done my way. Doesn't anybody care what I think around here? That's not the attitude of Christian life and ministry. We are just servants. I am a servant. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, the first thing that comes out here is we serve in spirit. We serve in spirit. Chapter 1 and verse 9. Whom I serve in my spirit. spirit. Little s spirit. Little s spirit. So we understand, I don't think this is new information to most of you here today, that we are three-part people, tripartite beings. Body, soul, and spirit. spirit. How do we serve? Whom we serve in spirit. How many of you uh, are extroverts? In a normal group, about 48 to 49 percent of you at least are extroverts, so I'm not getting honest responses here yet. How many of you are extroverts? Don't be ashamed of it. It's not bad to be an extrovert. Okay, well, I need three of you to come up here real quickly. I think I got three right in that row, so the three of you who raised your hand, come on up here. Bless you. Yes, you know who you are because you're extroverts. Okay, we're getting good. No, come on up here, Mal. It'll work better if Mal's here. Thank you. Yes, and you should be the rose between the two thorns. Thank you. So, so body, soul, spirit. Here's the problem in our lives. Body is very noisy. Body is always saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. 
body is always saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. A body is always saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Good. What? Pick me, pick me, pick Good. me. Pick me, pick me. Good. And spirit, spirit's not so loud. Spirit tends to go like this. Pick me, pick me, pick me. Aww. Hey, I'm over here, pick me, pick me. And soul, which is your emotions and your thoughts and your feelings is your control center. Pick me. <laughs> and soul has to make a decision. No, you don't do that. You're not that gentle. <laughs> Body always says, pick me, pick me, pick me. And spirit is... And you, you've, you've got a choice to make. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> Hey, pick me. Seriously, better option. I, I think I better end this illustration real quickly. Here. But, 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 but here, here, here is the challenge. The flesh is really loud, and there's a real tendency in our lives to respond to the noisy flesh and try to do ministry in the flesh and do things that flesh wants us to do because then we get some attention. Mm -hmm. And spirit just gently woos us. No. <laughs> gently <laughs> woos us. Yeah. And we need to learn, friends, that real ministry, real ministry does not take place over here. Real ministry takes place when we respond to spirit. Give the three extroverts a crowd a hand. <laughs> Thank you. I should have mentioned that you're going to be famous on, on, and on YouTube now. <laughs> Real ministry takes place in, in spirit. And we dare not, we cannot, we must not have any confidence in the flesh. The flesh wants you to believe in him because <laughs> he's noisy and he loves getting attention. He loves getting recognition. <laughs> but don't go there. Ministry takes place in, in spirit. I was reminded of that uh, this week as I was preparing for this, because I began to think, here's this Paul. Paul has never yet been to Rome. In this portion, we, we look at, at some scriptures where, where he talks about how he has never been to Rome. And, and I'm thinking, well, if Paul has never been to Rome, how come he's rejoicing in the fact that the, their understanding of the gospel is being proclaimed around the whole world. How did they ever get the gospel? And I discovered something. It's been in the Bible forever, but I discovered it this week. That the gospel in Rome was a work of the Spirit. All good ministry is always Spirit work. So we read this, how did the gospel get to Rome? Paul hadn't been there yet, and that there's a whole bunch of, uh, there's a whole huge crowd there. Acts chapter 2, and, uh, and verse number 10. Second line, this is the day of Pentecost, and who was there on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended? Visitors from Rome. <laughs> there were some visitors from Rome in Jerusalem both Jews and people who had converted to Judaism, 
And what was happening on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2? Read these two very exciting verses. Verses 5 and 6. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, this mighty rushing wind, these cloven tongues of fire on their head, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. I tell you how the gospel came to Rome. The Spirit of God came to Jerusalem and there were Romans there visiting that day and they heard the gospel preached in Italian as the Spirit of God came over people. They heard a clear declaration of the fact that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Jesus Christ was the Savior. Jesus Christ died for their sins. And on the third day, up from the grave, he arose. And as a result of the Spirit of God coming upon them, they went back to Rome and there was a great church established. All the work of the Spirit. Real ministry, friends. Real ministry, friends is always in spirit. The second thing that stuck out to me from verses nine and 10 is that uh, when you're serving, you're also serving in, in prayer. Verse number 10, always in my prayers making request. Charles Spurgeon, I have a library of every one of the sermons he preached. It says, no one, no wonder, talking about the Romans, no wonder they prospered so well when Paul always made mention of them in his prayers. Some churches would prosper better if some of you remembered them more in prayer. He was preaching to his own congregation at London Gospel Tabernacle. I wonder if there are churches in Saskatoon. I wonder if there are churches in in Dalmany and Martinsville and Warman and Osler and Bigger and Unity and Dundurn that would prosper more if we as a church family took upon ourselves to pray for them. Paul didn't know this church at all. He'd never been there. But he prayed for them. And real ministry understands the power that comes when in the secret place we cry very unselfish prayers, prayers that have no benefit for us, but for his name's sake we pray him. Ministry rooted in serving always includes prayer. And thirdly, it includes serving in the preaching of the gospel. Chapter 1 and, and verse number 9. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the Gospel, verse number 15. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel. Verse number 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. This preaching of the gospel. I have uh, been undergoing some spiritual surgery in my heart over the last four months or so. As the Holy Spirit has been challenging me about preaching the gospel, This matters for the gospel is the, the gospel is the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I have upstairs in that office 
a filing cabinet full of about 1,800 sermons. A lot of them should be thrown out and put in the garbage because they have titles like this, Six Ways to Make Perfect Fried Rice. There's no power in that. The power is in the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Can I ask you a question? May I? Are you proud of the gospel? Yes. Are you proud of the gospel? Amen. Because we live in a culture that's very noisy and keeps saying, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. A culture that doesn't want us to talk about sin or identify anything as sin. Are you proud of the gospel? We live in a culture that doesn't want to have to have to bow at the the feet of a holy God that wants to do whatever they feel like doing. Are we proud enough of the gospel <laughs> to stand up in a culture that thinks that way? Or have we grown a little bit ashamed of the gospel and we don't want to, be, we don't want to stick out we don't want to be old fuddy-duddies who in the midst of a world where anything and everything goes still believes there's, there is such a thing as sin and wrong and there are things that offend Almighty God. Are we proud of the gospel? Or are we ashamed of the gospel? Paul says... I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Stand up, John. Come stand beside me. Now, everybody in their right mind should be ashamed of wearing a shirt like this. <laughs> I don't but, care. <laughs> but, but we should never be ashamed of the gospel. We should have the same attitude that John has. I don't care what people think. I know what I believe in. Amen. That's right. Bless you. You may be seated. You're going to be on YouTube too. <laughs> We're not ashamed. We're not ashamed. We're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the... It's the power of God unto salvation. 